All right, we have Clutch versus Optic. It's gonna be a shit show. <laughs> what can I say? It's definitely gonna be a shit show. Clutch is very dysfunctional as a team. Optic also very dysfunctional as a team, but somehow manages the best early game. They brought in Dardock instead of Meteor for this game. Dardock and Piglet definitely have a bit an agenda for each other. I would say they actively hate each other, but they definitely want to win versus the other one so much more. So, yeah, let's have at this. Draven or got Yorick banned from Clutch. Allistar Cassio. Yasuo banned. Oh, they actually opened up Lucian for Piglet. Interesting. Interesting. Fresh blind, something we see a lot, especially with Alistar gone. Jace blind also, something we do see a lot. Let's see what they take with Braum. Braum Lucian. I mean, what to say about this lane? It's a Braum Lucian lane. Level 2 power spike, boys. Nocturne, this gives them a really solid way to play 1-3-1 or a really solid way to play into team fights with Nocturne Engage and Braum follow up afterwards. It gives Clutch a very solid way to play the game. It, it makes draft very straightforward for Clutch, let's say that. For Optic, drafting Zoe, I mean Zoe plus Jace, Jace in a side lane, a lot of poke, Zoe a lot of poke, Jace also providing priority. LeBlanc ban. Mm. They're just protecting the Zoe pick with what they think Clutch might pick. LeBlanc ban, Rumble ban. I do feel like Rumble ban is more targeted towards top side. And they ended up banning Kalista Israel. Those are arrow champions that he's most likely play into Lucian. Kaiza into Lucian is not Gucci though. Oof, I would I'm not feeling Kaiza into Lucian that much. I'm trying to see, let me try to think of a better pick, but Kaifan to Lucian is something I'm not feeling that much. What would I pick into Lucian if Israel Kaifa is gone? That's not. Or Israel Kalista is gone, that's not Kaifa. Caitlyn? Nah. Ash is okay into Lucian, but Ash versus Braum Nocturne sounds like a nightmare. Maybe Kaisa is the best thing and you just scale. Play Vlad into Lucian. <laughs> okay, so something super interesting happened here that I do want to talk about. They picked Malphite, thinking it wasn't to Jace. So, who needs like, okay guys, I get it, I get it. I need to play tanks. I'm going to play Malphite into Jarvan. It'll be good for our comp. I'll play Malphite into Jace. And then they're like, trollolo, trollolo, we're gonna pick Vlad, and Jarvan's gonna, or J4 is gonna go jungle. Or not J4, Jace is gonna go jungle. The fucking flexibility. This is like a, I would call like a gambit, or a trick. So a gambit or like a trick is something you only fall to once, right? So this should never ever happen to any other team ever again that play versus optic when they have dardock in the fact that when they draft jace it doesn't necessarily mean jace top or jace mid but it can go jace jungle and not to draft something that can get really counter pick like a malphite but let's see how good dokla is at playing vlad into malphite yeah it works once and that's it and let's see how much they get out of this draft yeah flex picks become more and more important as time goes on and as people figure out drafts because they introduce flexibility like flexibility can't be like you have to prep for pick going both sides Dokla entered if you pick Vlad into Malphite you should not be entering you should just be winning the lane Their coach said they didn't have Vlad practice. It was a last minute counter pick. Oh my god. If you're gonna put fucking jungle Jace, then you should at least practice the counter picks into Malphite or the counter picks into. You have to be like, okay, we're gonna draft Jace and they're gonna draft a counter pick. 
and we're going to draft this pick into the counter pick. <laughs> if playing Vlad correctly, you need to pull the lane as Vlad. Earlier on, you're weak as fuck. Vlad is really weak until he gets his double CDR items. Ugh, pause. He didn't go Klepto Vlad. Klepto Vlad's actually really good versus Malphite. I would have loved to seen Klepto Vlad. It is much harder to play though. Klepto Vlad is much, much harder, harder to play. Can you set up the VOD at a higher quality? I right, it's at... Oh, 480. Okay, I can bump it to 720. You can play Klepto Vlad versus Malphite, but I'm telling you, it is much, much harder. And if he doesn't have practice, it's better he runs Phase Shift. Josh tried, or Dardock tried an encounter jungle, but Lyra got the big race, which was huge. Is Syndra a counter to Zoe or the other way around? Syndra is, I would say, the more favorable side, but it's not a hard counter. It's a skill matchup that has a lot to do with jungle matchup on top of it also. Piglet Lucian is awful in lane. That's hard to believe. Lucian's one of Piglet's best champions. He's doing W max, or three levels in W. Doran Ring Lucian. But not building a gold lead, that's weird. Or not building a CS lead. Huh, it is weird how Piglet isn't building a lead. Hooney fucking coming in with the Malphite ult. Good roam from Hooney. Let's talk about kind of the win conditions and how we want things to play out for both teams. So later on, what Optic should be able to do is have Vlad split push versus the Malphite and actually 1v2 both the Malphite and the Nocturne. Vlad can definitely hit a state where he's pretty much invulnerable versus the Malphite and the Nocturne and friends. Oh man, that was kind of sad. Let's see how that went down. Coming in, Huni right here. Let's play this slower. Huni starting with ult. R, E, W, Q, oof. Okay, there was no way to live that. Yeah. Once he got ulted, there was no way to live that. The only way he could have lived that was if he pulled the Malphite ult. And that would have been really hard for him to execute. But anyways, talking back into the later states of the game, what Optic wants to happen... 
Ooh, crown solo killing Demonte. I, mean, I guess Stardock helped. Never mind, not a solo kill. But what Optic wants to happen is create a game state where Vlad is side slip pushing a side lane and they can send the Thresh behind the Vlad or Vlad gets strong enough where he can 1v2. There's just situations that Optic wants to create where it's in a side lane, Vlad is just extremely strong and they want to keep waiting for that state to come. As for Clutch, what they want to do is before Vlad can get to that state or even when Vlad is at that state, they're pushing up mid far enough or they're well prepped near objectives enough where they're kind of the forcing the team fight onto Optic before Vlad can really get onto turrets. So it's really important that both teams are playing to their win condition for Optic, which is side lane pressure and winning the side lane and winning the map in a wide way with Vlad for Clutch, it's going to be playing to team fights and opening the team fights first. Damn, Crown's actually doing such a good job of landing bubbles and stuff. Oh. That fucking lantern from Dok or from Big too. Oof. I looked at Big's hairline and I just checked my hairline to make sure it wasn't as bad. <laughs> it's not good press W, it's good knowing where to be and giving the lantern in advance. Big is a top four support. Oh, that's a statement. That's a statement. Core JJ, Dazel, Smoothie. Core JJ, Dazel, Smoothie. Wow. Holy shit, Demonte fucking dunking Syndra. Core JJ, Dazel, Smoothie. Afro's been poor. Core JJ, Dazel, Smoothie, Vulcan maybe? I would I would rate Vulcan over, ugh, it's hard to say. Okay, let's focus back on the game. I'll try to play Spick. Haku, Haku, actually Haku for sure. God, Crown's actually so impressive when it comes to Zoe. It's really hard to score the Syndra like that. Two kills. What the fuck? Why and how? What? Oh my god. Either be in a side lane or don't show. It's really, really bad for Vlad to die like this. It's so important for Vlad to constantly pressure the lanes and play with the priority of the team. Uh, there's just a certain point, there's a certain threshold that Vlad can hit that can allow him to destroy side lanes, but he's getting further and further away from it from how he's playing. Dokula just has no idea what he's playing for or the kind of game state that he wants to be in. Like contesting for objectives is okay, but that's not how you play Vlad in terms of setting up for objectives.
Well, but whoever said watch Piglet flaming this game, it's really bad. I wouldn't say it was bad. But I, I'm very surprised that Piglet didn't build a lead. You guys are going to say, but he has a 17 CS lead. That's not a lead on Lucian versus Kai'Sa. If the lead you're going to give me as a Lucian versus Kai'Sa is 17 CS at 20 minutes, give me the Kai'Sa instead. What the fuck happened in lane? Honestly, what the fuck happened? He didn't back until 80 CS. <laughs> Big shit on Piglet. And this rotation into top turret is nice. Oh my god, he's going fucking... I'm not sure, but he's going haunt... He went haunting guys on Vladimir. This is not the correct build. He's going Morello's Vladimir. This fucker's going Morello, Vladimir. Or, not Morello, Leandre, Vladimir. Yeah, oh my goodness. Not what you want, buddy. You want to go death cap. You want the highest AP possible. Remember what I said? Vlad in a 1v2 situation with someone trailing him, like a Thresh, I mean, it was the Jace that trailed them, but this is the exact situation that they want. Where Vlad can handle Nocturne and Malphite, and they can keep pushing up, and Malphite and Nocturne feel really pressured. Optic slowly getting into the game state, that's good for them. Slowly getting there, Vlad playing the side lanes. And, and Clutch have no idea what they need to be doing. They need to be setting up team fights and opening and engaging first, but they're never in that situation. RQ. Did he start with RQ? Oops. I just want to double check, make sure he started with RQ. That's the best thing that Vlad can do. He, you can even QR, but it's hard for Vladimir to, that haven't played a lot of Vladimir to QR. He needs to start with RQ. Yes, Eid. Oh, he didn't RQ. He just RE'd. When you. RQ and then eat W, you cut off your lighter half of Q animation with W, so you can do RQ almost instantly. He should have done RQ eat W. Okay. There, oh my god, what the fuck. There's a lot of small mechanical things on Vlad. I'm not going to be too harsh on him because um, Croissant or who is it, Zabotin said it's like his first time playing Vladimir, but they're just small mechanical things that I'm kind of disappointed to see. Scuttle. Vlad in a side lane, split push while setting up Baron. Vlad in a side lane, keep split pushing. Vlad needs to not play scared. And if they feel like Nocturne's going behind the Vlad, they need to send Thresh over to make sure Thresh can help. Oh my fucking god. Why are you half HP? What the fuck did you do? Why are you half HP? You're half HP versus the mouth fight. I fucking don't understand. Okay, so you approach with full HP. You EQ. You end up losing the trade and you're half HP. Or he's like 3 fourths HP. And then if he feels like Nocturne is coming to him, then he calls for the Thresh. Because Thresh can walk down. Because there's a pink word here and there's no word. Thresh can walk down and back up the Vlad without other people knowing. Oh my god.
God, this is just so fucking bad. <laughs> well, they get the Baron. <laughs> what a fiesta. Look at Malphite items. It doesn't matter what Malphite items are. Vlad beats Malphite at this stage in the game. But I guess Vlad has Leandris instead of a death cap, and that is definitely hurting him in a bit. Vlad doesn't beat him at this stage. Vlad should be winning at this stage. Vlad just has terrible items. After Vlad gets double CDR items, he shouldn't be losing to Malphite. Unless he falls behind really hard or Malphite gets really hard. When Malphite itemizes for MR and Vlad itemizes for straight AP, Vlad gets to shove out Malphite and also like, so what happens when Vlad and Malphite meet in lane is Vlad uses E and Q and he's able to shove the wave and Malphite can't deal with the shove and Vlad can maintain his HP. But the way Dokal is playing whenever they meet in lane is he's like trying to actively trade with the Malphite and he's not dealing with the wave properly. Oh, that was a nice thresh hook with Kaisa W to block out the Nocturne W. I will say, I am putting a lot of blame on Dokla, but also the foresight of Clutch or foresight of Optic isn't playing very well. They should have been able to control things a lot better. <laughs> uh, it's kind of sad, but a lot of Optic's lead are coming in from Clutch engaging where they shouldn't, and they're just chasing afterwards. <laughs> this game is a fiesta. Off fight engage, flat on backline. That was actually done pretty well. He jumped backline really well. Oh my god. <laughs> well, he finally had Void Staff though. That's gonna break the matchup a little. What are they getting engaged on? Mm, there's like just certain points in the game, like right here, right? Thresh should know, okay, we're slowly pushing the wave. We don't want them to engage. We just want this cannon minion to stay alive and keep getting barren. He hooked the Malphite and he got jumped on where Thresh should be staying in the back, being ready to W people. It's just little stuff like this. 
is it easy to buy most teams academy players depends on how good they think the players are so like vulcan and wiggly a lot of people wanted to buy but they weren't available because people thought clg thought wiggly was good clutch thought vulcan was good so they weren't willing to give up those players Oh my god, this game was such a fiesta. Highlights for this game. Crown actually played really well versus Demonte and Solo killed him a lot. Lyra and Huni needed knew what they needed to get done versus Vlad and actually pressured the Vlad a lot. Low light for this game, Dokla Vladimir play was really disappointing. And Piglet's Lucian play was actually also disappointing. I'm super curious why Piglet couldn't build the lead bot site. Oh my god, Dokla Vlad. Also, I really like what Optic did with their draft. What are my thoughts on Fake God? I don't watch that much Academy, so hard to say. Oh, Piglet actually going off here. He's somewhat saving the game for a clutch. <laughs> oh man, they're going to get Baron off this too. Holy shit. Wait, how did Clutch not get that Baron? Holy shit. Sorry, I blanked out for a second. They killed everyone. They killed everyone. Oh, and then Vlad had teleport. Okay, and understandable. <coughs> they killed everyone, but Vlad had teleport. Oh. Let's see how this collapse happens. Goes on Thresh, not a bad target to go on. Okay, and then they have to back off because Optic's gonna end if they don't back off. Really important that they push out mid. Like top lane, they can somewhat deal with, but if they can't push out mid and they can't walk in through that way, it's really hard for Clutch to do things. Mid lane is so much more important than top lane. Ugh, this is such an awkward situation. Where they kind of split up, where Demonte is pushing top and Piglet is pushing mid, so they're missing two members from the fight and they can't contest Baron. I know it's like, do or, you're dead if you do, you're dead if you don't kind of situation, but you still have to pick one side. Like You still have to be like, okay, we're going to push out and we're going to fight at Baron. If you don't fight at Baron, then you're just losing the game. They already lost, like, the game state is already so bad in this position. Also, why the fuck did Optic push out bottom? Oh, there's just so many questions that I have for these teams. When, when this happened, why didn't they send anyone bottom to push out? Okay, dragon coming up, bottom huge wave, getting blue, controlling this side, looking for flank. One person bottom while they defend dragon. One person bottom while they defend dragon. Okay, nobody bottom, and Vlad looking for a big loop. Oh, Vlad actually got the loop off. Oh my god, Vlad looking for loop? You can't get caught. Blast looping around. Ugh, this kind of situation is so bad because 
if his lantern gets cancelled with Worth here, like if they place Worth and cancel this lantern, this situation can actually go to hell. I'm not sure if Crown has done yet. Blood should be around here and he's looping around. Oh my god. Oh my god, he does that. He doesn't have Zanyas or anything. And Vlad was looping. And now their bot wave's bad too. 4v5. Vlad gets a good ult in middle of everyone. Okay, fight over. Vlad OP. Oh, this game was so stressful. There were so many points in the game where I feel like, oh, Team Y should win this. Team X should win this. And it, they made it so hard on themselves. Yikes. 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 Ugh. I really don't want to flame Dokla because he doesn't have a lot of experience on Vladimir, but that's also a problem in itself. If you know the kind of draft strategy you're going with, why do you not have experience on this champion? Just such a messy game. I will say, I've been looking more at Big, and he's better than I initially gave him credit for, and he's probably someone I should keep an eye on. He might be top half support. Well, let's, I'm actually down to check out Josh's interview. Let's see what he said. Let's do 1.25. Really eccentric fans out there welcoming you back to starting for Optic in the LCS. 2-0 weekend for you. Congratulations. But what are you doing back on the starting roster? Uh, I was brought in mainly because Zad thinks I have a lot of experience with we played so i've been on a team with piglet i've been on a team with Poonie, and i've been on a team with monte so i'd like to say i know how they play as players and zab thinks that uh was the reasoning for using me over will today that is smart. i think that's a bullshit reasoning i think that's 100 percent bullshit reasoning i think zabutin thinks josh is better than medios or they have plans to start josh in the future so they're saying yeah we brought you in because of huni piglet and all that while that might be partly but definitely, that's not the main reason they brought Josh in, and Josh is giving a good PR answer. You have the insider knowledge then on them. But uh, the last time that we spoke, you told me that before you went into your game, you had only played two games with Crown before playing in LCS. So did you get more practice for today? Yeah, me and Crown have a lot of practice. We play pretty well together. So it looks like Optic is kind of building towards that 10-man roster. You guys have spoken about it before. What's preparation for that like? A um, lot of internal uh, talking, like about what meta is. You know, and, like uh, we spend most of our day around each other. So local in the post pick and ban interview with Jeff, he said that Dardoch could play interesting picks like the Jace. Oh. I, yeah, I mean, that's definitely another reason they brought Dardoch in. What I'm trying to say, Ovly, is that I think the most and the primary reason that they would bring in Dardoch is that they think they might want to start Dardoch over Meteos in the future, right? That's the biggest reason they would bring Dardoch in. I don't think the six-man like swap is going to be a long-term viability thing for Optic, and they eventually have to decide between Dardoch and Meteos, and they are coming close to the decision point where they can't delay it any further. So I think the primary reason is they're deciding between Dardoch and Meteos, and they do want to give Dardoch stage time so they can make a better decision. All the reasons that you mentioned that Dardoch mentioned regarding um, Dardoch can play Jace and can do interesting things with Draft or, <laughs> or Dardoch saying, oh yeah, I have experience versus Piglet, Huni, and Demonte are I think all supplementary reason. And like the core, core reason is they need to decide their roster and they need to decide their starting jungle. Of course, from Dardoch's point of view and of course from Org's point of view, they're not going to say that. Yeah, I, I did miss that, obviously. So, yeah, thanks for the additional information. A lot of it is just talking and one, a lot of 1v1s and customs, especially. So, uh, honestly, util, utilizing the 10-man roster is honestly just as simple as it sounds. It's literally just using all 10 players and just making sure that they're... Uh, uh, it's mutually beneficial, the relationships between Academy and LCS. <laughs> this is such a <laughs> canned response. Mutually beneficial, mutually beneficial, mutually beneficial. There is certain words when players say that I feel like is has been taught to them. I feel like this is Diablo team speaking through Dardoch, not Dardoch speaking. Guys, 10-man roster will be mutually beneficial. And then if you say it enough to the players, they'll start saying it themselves. And you're like, I know, I know. Who's the 1v1 king in the house? 
Austin, Gabe. Ooh, I'm excited to see more of that. But Dardock, thank you and congratulations again. And for more on the game, let's hear from the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, Avli. It's cool to hear that. Uh... I I think I don't think there will ever be a situation where teams will come out and say like what they really mean. Because uh, here's like the big thing about coaching, guys, and here's the big thing about running teams that I think a lot of people miss the point on. What's best for Dardock? And what's best for Medios might not be what's best for Optic, right? Optic wants the players to do, and Optic wants the team to operate in a way where all the moves they make is best for Optic. And it would be great if players just bought into that. The team is the most important, but they also have individual needs and they also have selfish needs. So it's never about that. It's how much buy-in you can get from your players so like just selling that story of a 10 man roster and selling, hey, mutually beneficial, like all that stuff is great from Optic and they want to do much of that. And I want to praise them. But on the other hand, from a viewer perspective and from to give you guys on the real perspective, that's fucking bullshit. Like Optic just wants to figure out who their best players are and start them. And the 10 man roster thing is to make sure everyone's engaged much as possible. This is like the no bullshit answer for you guys. Why would players be happy with a 10-man roster? Like, people say, I'm happy sharing a spot, I get to learn. But if you're in a position where you get all the starting spot and all the starting time, but you don't have to share your spot, then people, players would much prefer it. Like, 10-man roster... Even, even like, so it's completely different from traditional sports. I know people are going to bring up traditional sports. You cannot play the full time in traditional sports. You cannot play, you cannot play the entirety of a football game or entirety of a NBA game because you have like physical tiredness and like physical body aches or physical whatever you go through. So you can't play the full 10 man game, 10, or you can't play the whole game anyway. So that's why 10 man roster is required in NFL and NBA and all that. But for esports, that's completely different. And you, okay, so people are bringing up Korea. Like they do 10 man roster in Korea. So of course they do 10 man roster in Korea because they have wealth of talent and they're just trying to make people compete. Even when they like, what are some 10 man rosters in Korea? SKT, they have a 10 man roster. Have you guys seen Crazy Play once? Have you guys seen Haru play once? Is it an actual 10-man roster? It's not an actual 10-man roster. No teams are truly running 10-man rosters. Afrika 10-man 16-hour scrim day. Afrika is a crazy team on their own. I, I, will, I will give into that argument where Afrika is utilizing their 10-man roster and their team is more about their coach than it is about any of their players. But even then, Afrika still knows who their core players are. And on game day, like they are gonna play their core players and Keen, their core players and Yukal. They are swapping around a lot, but Keen and Yukal are their like bread and butter players that they don't swap around.